This is the SF Productions Podcast Network. You know, there were PCs before IBM came along. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. You can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife Free Comics on iTunes, or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. So we recently talked about early video game systems. Yes. But what about desktop computers? Yes. Uh, a lot of people don't seem to remember that before the PC versus Mac religious wars began, mm-hmm. there were a lot of players out there. Right. It wasn't just, you know, Dell and blah, 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 making right. PCs. Right. So I was inspired to talk about this by another podcast called Antic, an Atari 8-bit podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to skip the IBM PC players as well as Apple because, you know, uh, we could talk about those for quite a while on, all on yes. their own. I'm also skipping Atari for now because I'm going to save that for a future episode. You know a lot about your Atari. About the Atari stuff, yeah. So while the name desktop computer goes actually back to the 1960s, the earliest models were actually built into a desk. <laughs> yes. So they weren't really desktop. They were desk, desk computers. computers. Yes. They don't really count. Now, there was the mother of all demos given in 1968 by Douglas Engelbart, a very famous demo, where he showed email, word processing, hypertext, which is the basis for the Internet, video conferencing, and a mouse. But it required the exclusive use of a mainframe to have enough power to do it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But this was very prescient of what we do today with computers. Yes. And there were also some models in the early 70s that were kind of progenitors. The Xerox Alto is considered the first GUI or graphical user interface computer, but it never reached the general consumer market. It was sold into businesses and maybe a little educational. Well, nobody ever imagined that you would need a computer in your home. Right. (laughs) Now, Apple and Microsoft later borrowed concepts from the Xerox Alto for the for Mac and Windows. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and if you were an electronic hobbyist, you could build kits like the Altair. Mm-hmm. It had no permanent storage. Right. Or a display. Mm-hmm. Or a keyboard. Yes. It was a box with switches on it. Yes. And you had to program it by flipping switches every time you turned it on. And not just, I'm flipping a switch. You had to program it. Flip, 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 Over and over and over and over and over to get to the point where you actually could load anything. And that's even to have an operating system, much less an application. Yes. And you had to do that every time you turned it on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, not really practical. <laughs> 1977 was the first wave of true consumer personal computers. I was in high school in 1977. Mm-hmm. And I was in, like, junior high. Junior high. high. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm older. Just slightly. Um, <laughs> tiny amount. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Boy, you're justifying that yes. strangely. No, no, no. no. <laughs> okay. Now, of course, there's Apple computers yes. were there, but there were also the Commodore PET 2001. Mm-hmm. I inherited one from my father-in-law, and it still runs. Yes, <laughs> and I remember using that when I was uh, in high school and then in college. <laughs> now, it has a built-in monitor, mm-hmm. has cassette storage, because that's how you did storage yes, back then. Yes, there was not a floppy drive on it. Right. Um, you had a chiclet keyboard. You mm-hmm. had a, a floppy disk as an add-on, add-on in a big, huge box. A yes. separate seat. This was all in, like, big sheet metal, you know, you know, heavy computer. Had a massive between 4 and 8K of memory. K. K. Now, keep in mind, the smartphone that you have in your pocket right now, most likely, has literally a million times more storage than that. More memory than that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Because <laughs> it goes kilobyte, a thousand times more is a megabyte, and a thousand times more is a gigabyte. You have gigabytes of memory in your in your phone. Mm-hmm. And they sold, as I said, in the business and educational markets into the early 80s, but never really caught on for consumers. Mm-hmm. And they cost between $595 and $795, and which was like a few grand back then. Mm-hmm. Then there's... The TRS-80, a.k.a. the Trash-80, Trash 80. Model yes. 1, yes. Mm-hmm. which I also inherited one from my father-in-law. Yes. Uh, it was sold by the now nearly departed Radio Shack. Yes. And TRS actually uh, st- stood for Tandy Radio Shack. Mm-hmm. 
So they needed a replacement for falling CB radio sales my at the time. My dad also had a CB radio. <laughs> of course he did. <laughs> I love my dad. <laughs> so stores could, they figured stores could also use it to run inventory if it didn't sell. Because mm. they literally made one computer for each store initially, and then, well, we'll see if it sells. And if it doesn't sell, you can run inventory for so your store. So my, my dad must have got somebody's inventory <laughs> system. <laughs> has a real keyboard, mm -hmm. an external monitor, mm -hmm. a cassette drive, and because they actually threw in a consumer cassette recorder in, in the mix. Mm -hmm. So they just took one of those off the shelf. Here you go. Here's, yes. a, here's your cassette drive. Yeah. And an expansion module for a floppy drive. Started at $599 with the monitor, the cassette drive, and again, 4K of memory. And it's worth noting, of course, that all of these monitors were all monochrome. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. We're not talking graphic displays. This is all monochrome text. Yes. Successor models were sold actually into the early 80s, and then Radio Shack moved into the IBM PC-compatible business mm -hmm. at that point. The second wave hit in the early 80s, just as IBM began to get into the business. Mm -hmm. Commodore came out with the VIC-20, the successor to the PET, mm -hmm. 4K of RAM, this time expandable to a massive 64K of RAM. I remember when that went up and we just thought, oh my gosh, that's so much memory. <laughs> oh. Has a real keyboard, no monitor. You had to hook it up to your TV, which is mo what most of these now did. There was an internal cartridge port and external cassette drive. And it was only $299 for the base model. So a much better introductory price. Yes. And the Commodore 64 replaced that, started out standard with 64K of memory, had better sound and video, and it actually outsold the rest of the entire computer market, including IBM, through the mid-80s. And why do you suppose that was? Because at the beginning, the IBM PCs were thousands Still, of dollars. Yeah, uh-huh. You couldn't, you know, so, and this was, you know, 399 or whatever mm -hmm. it was. Texas Instruments also wanted to sell computers in order to sell their own chips. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> so they had what they called the TI-99-4. It was introduced actually in 79, but never sold very well. Replaced by the TI-99-4A <laughs> in 1981. Keep in mind, Texas Instruments, all engineers, didn't really understand how to actually make a name of a product. Yeah. They just put numbers on things. Mm -hmm. It was the first 16-bit processor... And keep in mind, everything was all 8-bit until then. And how many bit are we at now? 64-bit, <laughs> who mm, knows. Yeah. Uh, Built-in keyboard, lots of peripherals, including a speech synthesis module, because TI was into that, and a huge expansion box. I mean, basically the size of a larger traditional desktop PC. Unfortunately, they got caught in a price war with Commodore, that, so even though they had a much better computer in terms of specs... They dropped out of the market by 83. Because really, you know, the consumer at this point does not know much about computers no. other than the price. Exactly, and that's yes. what they're buying it based on. Mm -hmm. And still today, to some extent, that's what's still happening. Sinclair Research, a company out of the UK, came out with the SX series between 80 and 82. The SX81, which was their most successful model, had a massive 2K of RAM, but it was expandable to 64K, and a membrane keyboard. So it wasn't even a chiclet keyboard. <laughs> it was just this flat surface with this membrane on it. <laughs> and you had to go, uh, uh, did, I, did I hit the button? Did I not? Yes. None of these were really designed for, say, word processing no. or anything. So Timex licensed and sold it in the U.S. for about $100 initially. A huge seller due to the low cost. Coleco followed up their successful ColecoVision video game system with the Atom. In 1983, for $725, you got a computer with 80K of RAM, a built-in cassette drive, and a printer. <laughs> and it was all compatible with the ColecoVision games. Mm -hmm. So, okay, this is great. Unfortunately, it took a very long time to actually reach the market. And it had a lot of technical issues which kind of killed it. Yes. Such as... When you, tuned, when you turned it on, it generated a huge ma electromagnetic surge that would wipe cassettes and other media that were near it, including the media you would have in the unit. It's like it's its own EMP. <laughs> Just a slight problem. Yes. So by this point, mm -hmm. um, 
IBM basically took over with mm -hmm. their PC architecture. Mm -hmm. And from that point, the rest is history. And ever since then, it's been IBM, PC architecture, and of course, then in 84, Apple came in with the Mac. And that pretty much stabilized the market for many years. Yes. And now only today are we seeing new players as the idea of the personal computer starts to wane toward okay i just need to get to the web right and especially with the mobile devices that you know you can right you know your, your tablet or your, your phone. phone completely replaces the need for a desktop computer right so right so you can check out our audio podcast how i got my wife to read comics on itunes or on our website sfpodcastnetwork.com from the pop culture bunker i'm mindy and i'm mark thanks for watching and enjoy computing <laughs>